been killed unnecessarily. And we should all understand, this economy is in grave danger of getting worse, not getting better. I mean, nobody should assume that 9% is the bottom. And in the absence of effective activity now, not, not when I'm president in 2013, but now, we could end up in a much deeper problem. And I think I just say that as a starting point. Second, it's tragic that President Obama cannot learn that class warfare and bureaucratic socialism kill jobs. And it's sad that he went to Detroit, it was the perfect symbolic place to go, if he'd gone there to listen. Detroit in 1950 had 1,800,000 people and the highest per capita income in the United States. Bad government has destroyed the city of Detroit. They now have fewer than 800,000 people. Over half their housing stock is unneeded. And they're 67th in per capita income. It would be wonderful if the president had gone there to learn that really bad government policies can do to America what really bad government policies have done here. So what would I do? First, I would urge uh, the House to send you immediately the repeal of Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is a devastatingly bad bill, which, which is inherently corrupt and which is killing small banks, killing small business, killing uh, the housing industry. Uh, not a single House Republican voted for it in the first round. It would be easy for them to repeal, set the stage for a huge fight over the very nature of highly centralized bureaucratic government. Second, we need to replace the Environmental Protection Agency with an Environmental Solutions Agency. When EPA is so out of cycle that even Obama has vetoed one of their rules, it should tell you how bad the agency has become. Third, you ought to repeal Sarbanes-Oxley, which is a destructive bill which cripples startups, cripples public health companies, and gains no particular advantage to the country. Fourth, you need a 21st Century Food and Drug Administration whose job is to go in the laboratory to help the scientists get the product to the market as fast as possible so we dominate the world health market, which will be the biggest market in the world. On tax policy, you ought to say no tax increase in 2013, period. Go to zero capital gains, so hundreds of billions of dollars pour into the country to be invested. Go to a 12.5% corporate tax rate. And I say to my liberal friends, ironically, General Electric will pay more taxes at 12.5% than they're paying at 35 because it won't profit them to hire all the lawyers to avoid the taxes. They currently pay zero at 35. Fourth, you ought to go to 100% expensing so that every American farmer, every American factory has the most modern equipment in the world, so we are the most productive, so we can compete with China and Indian win. Fifth, you ought to abolish the death tax permanently because it is an immoral tax which says if you work, save, and do the right thing your entire lifetime, politicians have the right to take your money. I think that's profoundly wrong. We want family businesses expanding, not getting smaller. We want them focused on job creation, not tax avoidance. Finally. You need an American energy plan. Here in South Carolina, you have at least $29 billion worth of natural gas offshore, and that's almost certainly a gross underestimate. We ought to have a bill like the Webb Warner bill, which I hope the House will pass unamended in the near future. Democratic bill, two Democratic senators in Virginia. It says, Virginia gets to develop oil and gas offshore. 50% of the revenue goes to the federal government, 37.5% to the Commonwealth of Virginia, 12.5% to land conservation and infrastructure. Here, you could take offshore development to create jobs, take part of the royalties to, to dredge the Charleston Harbor to make it modern so when the Panama Canal is widened in 2014, you're ready for it. You create jobs in Charleston, jobs offshore, you increase the wealth of the state, you increase the wealth of the country. Let me be clear. I am for more revenue through economic growth. I'm for more revenue through the development of federal lands. I'm for more revenue through an American energy policy. But I am against raising taxes. What would you do to deal with our debt? Uh, well, first of all, you get, as we did when I was Speaker, and we balanced the budget for four straight years and paid off $405 billion in debt, phase one is quit running a deficit. I mean, you can't do much about the debt until you get around to do, do we need a constitutional amendment to do that, in your opinion? I personally favor a constitutional amendment for practical reasons. A politician who has an open-ended ability to borrow money has too little incentive to say no to interest groups. But a politician who can say with a straight face, I can't do it, I can't, again, every state legislature in the country understands this. We have several speakers of the House here today, and they all understand this principle, that you can't spend more than you can take in because it's against the constitution of your state. It gives you an automatic bias at priority setting and at modernizing. I, but I also say about this, this what, what I believe is a really dumb idea of a super committee of 12. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole concept is just bizarre. Uh, you know, you have 535 House and Senate members. Why are 12 of them special? 
Um, you have 217 committees and subcommittees already standing. Why do you need a new one? Uh, I would say that there are at least six strategies that you could develop that would get you every penny they need without getting involved in the kind of negotiating that Washington loves. Because you, if you modernize the government, and I'll just give you one example. Go to Strong America now. If you modernize the federal government, the people who know how to do this for business believe they can save $500 billion a year. That's three times the amount the super committee is looking for. But it requires change. It requires doing it different. And it's very hard to get Washington to slow down and learn new things. Thanks, Newt. Um, Mr. Speaker, you have um, gone through a list of your priorities, uh, five or six or so. And so I would ask you, if you had to select the highest priority, as Speaker, you've chosen HR1, HR2, and on down the line, what would be your presidential plank number one as the highest priority in the platform as President of the United States? Uh, it would be the King Bill to repeal Obamacare. <laughs> 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 Got you. <laughs> okay, now that I no further questions. Well, we <laughs> uh, I am just slightly stumped. So uh, <laughs> I would. Uh, I'll take you this other one, and I'll go completely from levity, which actually is serious, down was, to very serious. I just signed your poster. That's why I was thinking of it. Um, also, as speaker. You've had to make those decisions, and as President of the United States, they would be more profound, they would weigh more heavily. There's a point that comes when there's no one you can share that load with. When you've taken all of the advice from counsel on both sides of an argument, you have to put that in and sum it into your morals, your, your, um, your knowledge base, and your intellect, and close the door in their oval, oval office. How do you make that decision that is a destiny decision for the country and life and death for Americans and others? You know, that's a very profound question. And one of the most interesting case studies in how that works is Lincoln. Lincoln in 1860 gives a great speech, and it's a very rational lawyer's speech. Lincoln in March of 1865 gives his greatest speech, his second inaugural. And it is an agonizing, painful speech, which in 702 words, references God 14 times and quotes the Bible twice. I recommend everybody to someday go to the Lincoln Memorial, stand there and read that speech out loud slowly, which is how he did it. In the intervening years, 620,000 Americans had died, more than all of our other wars. And Lincoln had been driven to read the Bible every day, to pray profoundly, to ask why God was putting us through this. I think anyone who would not face the most serious questions by asking God's guidance and God's grace and asking God's help would be a person who totally misunderstood the nature of life and who would be dangerous uh, holding a major office. So I think, uh, I would hope anyone would answer you by saying in a truly big decision, but frankly small decisions, I mean, I find myself very often praying just before I speak or just before, I mean, there are, having, seeking God's guidance strikes me as being at the heart of whether or not you can survive in a world of danger and in a world of temptation uh, and in a world where evil always lurks. Um, thank you. On, uh, on the immigration issue, and I, just a previous question comes back to me, and that is that there are 50 billion people in foreign countries that are in line waiting to come into the United States legally, and we allow in about a little over a million people a year, the most generous nation on earth by far, and yet we have 10 or 12 or more million people in here that are illegally. Uh, illegally. What, though, from that number of a million, is there such a thing as too many legal immigrants, and how would you define that? And how would you, uh, and would you support a merit system to identify their ability to contribute to this economy rather than familial and any other means that we have? I think that there is, uh, there are two practical limitations to the number of people you can absorb. One of them is the, the, the degree to which your economy is flourishing or not flourishing. I mean, if you're in a boom period and you have the opportunity to absorb talent and absorb energy, you can, by definition, absorb more people uh, than if you're, as we are right now, in a period of, of uh, either deep recession or depression, depending on your view. Um, second is a question of assimilation. When you have a country which is proud of its history, 
which is proud of its language, which is comfortable saying to people, come to America to be Americans. You can absorb more people than if you have a country whose elites are totally confused and are prepared to give up on being an American. And so I think the whole question, you know, if we're not going to be a melting pot, we can't afford to have very many people come here. Uh, when you realize that there are over 200 languages spoken in the Chicago school system. Uh, there are over 180 languages spoken at, at, at Miami Dade Junior College. Uh, that's why I favor English as the official language of government. We need a unifying system which says, yes, we are eager to have people come to America as they always have, but we want you to come here to be American. We don't want you to come here to be confused about how this country operates. So that's a, that's a part of it. I also think, uh, and, and this is controversial, but I think we have to deal with it. I think you've got to break down the approach to immigration. You cannot pass a comprehensive law. President Bush couldn't pass one with a Republican House and Senate. President Obama can't pass one with, didn't pass one with a Democratic House and Senate. I think you start with control of the border. And I have a very simple model, which is control of the border means 100% control of the border. I mean, you can tell, are people getting in illegally or not? Are drugs getting in illegally or not? If they're not, you control it. If they are, you don't control it yet. And I would put the number of resources necessary. There are more Department of, of Homeland Security people, bureaucrats in Washington, than there are people assigned to the border. So I'd be willing to take half the people currently serving in Washington, ship them to Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. I would do that. And so in the seconds left, I would ask, um, would, you, uh, would you extend a fence till they quit going around the end? 10 seconds. I, I want 100% control of the border. The, I mean, yep, the entire Texas-Mexico border is a river. Now, surely you should be able to patrol a river. Now, whether you patrol the river by building a fence or you patrol a river by putting 650 DHS bureaucrats standing shoulder to shoulder, there are a variety of ways of doing it. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to close this thing, but it's important to get this straight. We won the Second World War in 44 months. From Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, to victory over Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan was three years and, six, or three years and, uh, eight, and eight months. 44 months. This idea that Ronald Reagan in 1986 writes in his diary, we, I'm signing the Simpson-Mazzoli Act because we have to control the border. Thank you, Mr. And we're told today that people can't control the border is baloney. Thank, Thank you, you all very much. I'll speak to Newt Gingrich. And our next congressman is Congressman Ron Paul from Texas. Congressman Paul, come on up. Hey, Newt. Good job. Congressman Ron Paul, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hey, Jim. You have three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the format. I understand that we were supposed to address the subject of first principles. I've been trying to do that for about 35 or 40 years, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about first principles. Because that's what America is all about, and the first principle for America should be liberty. And I think we've forgotten about that, and we now are run by a bunch of lobbyists and special interests, and we have forgotten about liberty. But uh, Thomas Jefferson was very clear about liberty, and he told us where liberty came from. It came from the, our creator, it didn't come from our government. And uh, if we believe in liberty, we have to also understand exactly what our revolution was all about. Because the contest then at that time was uh, against tyranny, as all history has been, tyranny versus liberty. We had the best taste of liberty ever. And we had the freest country and the most prosperous country. And today it is slipping away. The last hundred years, I think it's been slipping away and it's a real challenge. But the founders decided that liberty was the cause and it should be the cause of all political action. And for that reason, they wrote a document that was not perfect, but it was really the best ever written. And it was designed for the purpose of indicating how to limit government. So the Constitution was written for the sole purpose of limiting the federal government, and that's what it should do. And the business was supposed to be left to the people and to the republic. 
I do not like the word democracy. The founders didn't like the word democracy, and we're supposed to defend our, our republic, which means personal liberty and limited government. But what did they put into the Constitution? They put some very precise things into the Constitution, 